Uh, last time we talked about uh, kind of the genesis of atomic structure at the end of class after we did everything else. I guess you're probably sort of getting a feel now for how what's involved in this weird time format that we do this class. So you know, we do all of this stuff, three hours worth of stuff, and then suddenly the next week it's on to something else. So that requires a lot of time on your part outside of class, just practicing, doing problems and, and everything. So I appreciate those of you who are keeping up, on, up with that. That's great. And if you're not, please start, because you're going to find yourself getting behind rather quickly. Um, I did have some trouble posting the videos from last week, but I think I've solved that, so those should be up shortly. Uh, and I'll, I'll put a link on, on Blackboard there. Let's talk about atoms. A lot of this stuff should be review, but again, we want to just refresh your memory, make sure you remember these things. Um, what's an atom? Don't read that definition. What's an atom? Yeah, it's, it's sort of the smallest particle of matter. Now, we know that's not exactly true, right? And why is that? It's smaller than an atom. Well, okay, you don't even have to go... You don't have to go that far. You can say protons and electrons and neutrons, right? And then, of course, there are smaller things like that. They're the smallest particles that make matter what it is, I guess, is kind of how I understand it. Um, protons, neutrons, and electrons are the same in every atom. But those collections of them actually are what make different atoms different. Uh, an atom overall is not going to ever have a net charge, um, so, which means, and as we've talked about, that the electrons and the protons need to be in numerical balance. Right? And elements, whether charged or not, are always identified by the number of protons. Okay? Number of protons. So calcium has 20 protons. We look up on the periodic table, see that calcium is element number 20. Okay? And that means that a calcium atom must also have 20 electrons to balance out that charge. The number of neutrons, however, can be different and not affect either of those things because neutrons, of course, have no charge. So what do we call atoms that have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons? Isotopes, Isotopes right. And to express that, we can write it whoops, in two different ways. We can either write it like this where we have the atomic number on the bottom and the mass, or the mass number on the top. Right? Or we can write it like this, since really having both the 20 and the calcium is redundant. We, if it has 20 protons, it has to be calcium, no matter what else is going on in there. So to say that it's calcium with 20 protons is redundant. So just having the 40 in there is what's important, because that tells us that there are 20 neutrons as well. All right, I don't think this talks about, well, OK, let's get into that. Just a couple terms before we get into some, some more of this. Um, the atomic number is the number of protons. Again, the defin defining characteristic of the atom, we call it z. And then the mass number is the sum of the mass for the electrons, protons, and neutrons. So why is it? If that's the case, and if these things are all measured in atomic mass units, which are defined as the average mass of proton and a neutron uh, and an electron, what, uh, why is, let's say, carbon not just 12? Why is the atomic mass of carbon 12.011 and not 12 if it has exactly six protons and six neutrons? You know why that is? You could say that for, for any of them. Right? Why, why aren't they whole numbers if a proton is 1 and a neutron is 1? We write the isotopes that way. Why is the atomic mass fractional? Because um, it's the average of the isotopes of carbon. That's right. It's, these are kind of an, uh, an observation. This is an average of all of the isotopes of a given atom. Um, carbon, for example, has two common and one somewhat common isotope. You have carbon 12, carbon 13, 
and carbon-14. Carbon-12 is about 99% of the carbon in the world. Uh, carbon-13 is about 1%, and carbon-14 is much less than that, maybe 0.1% or less. 0.01%, I don't remember exactly. It's pretty low. So if we actually average those out, you're going to have mostly 12, a little bit of 13, and a tiny, tiny bit of 14. And the average of all of that comes out to about 12.011. Now sometimes you can figure out the most common isotope by whichever one is it's closest to, like carbon. Carbon 12 is most common. The others are a little bit more. Nitrogen, nitrogen 14 is by far the most common. The other isotopes are much, much less common. Uh, same with oxygen 16. You see how the numbers are very close to the whole number. But that's not the case with all elements. Uh, for instance, bromine has two common isotopes. And I think we're going to deal with this in the lab uh, next week. Yeah, we will. Bromine has two common isotopes, bromine 79 and bromine 81. And they're about 50-50, about half and half. But if you look at the atomic mass of bromine, element 35, you'll see that it actually looks like it's more like 80. But no bromine 80 really exists. So it's actually an average of the two on either side that are split about half and half. Um, that's true for many of them. For radioactive elements, whose isotopes don't stick around for long enough to really uh, calculate them, the most common or most stable isotope is usually listed. So you'll see like um, plutonium number 94 has 244 in parentheses, which means that the plutonium 244, which is plutonium with how many neutrons? How many neutrons in plutonium-244? 150, right? Because you got 94 protons plus 150 is 244. Sorry, I took you by surprise with the subtraction. It's, it's tough. Um, that means that it'll have 150 neutrons, and that's the state where plutonium is the most stable. So that one has the longest half-life, or it sticks around the longest. And then I, there's a couple examples that are only have one isotope. 100% um, abundance. I don't think that's actually true. I don't, I don't think fluorine 19 is the only isotope. I have to look that up. Maybe it's right. Okay. So now let's talk about what happens when we lose electrons or when we do other things with the electrons. Um, now you've probably heard of bonds. So before kind of just going through all of this, what types of bonds have you heard of? Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, what? Peptide bonds. Yeah, these are all types of chemical bonds, or at least chemical interactions. And uh, we're going to talk today specifically about covalent bonds and structural formulas. And then we'll probably get to talking about ions as well. Um, covalent bonds. Well, I guess we should be more general first. Bonds hold atoms together. You can have free atoms, or they can be together. Now, actually, covalent and ionic don't describe all the types of bonds. There's, there's another one. Does anybody know what it is? Uh, actually, that's, that's an intermolecular interaction, like hydrogen bonds, but close. Uh, do I have a picture of it here? I don't know if I have a picture of it down here. I guess not. Um, It's actually called metallic bonds. So like, if you have a big sample of, let's say, copper, or pick your metal, whatever, uh, that's made up of copper atoms, of course, but they're not ions. And they're not covalently bound together. They're actually involved in an interaction called a metallic bond. So uh, indeed, bonding holds all the elements together, all atoms together, even in those situations. 
Um, uh, something like an argon or a neon gas doesn't form any bonds, and the atoms just float around freely, so you don't have the atoms being held together. Let's be very specific about our terminology. When two or more atoms share electrons, okay, so you've got a carbon and a hydrogen, and there are two electrons between them that are being shared, we call that a covalent bond. Uh, we'll talk more about what that precisely means uh, when we get into some quantum mechanics, but for now, they're just sharing these electrons. When you have a group of these atoms that are sharing electrons together, that is called a molecule. You've probably heard that term before. I'm not trying to teach you new words here, but just define them more precisely. What a molecule is not is anything held together by other interactions. We don't have ionically bound molecules. We don't have metallically bound molecules. We only have covalently bound molecules. It's the only way that you can hold uh, atoms together and call it a molecule. Um, and then, of course, we have the chemical formula, which will apply to many different chemical species, including molecules. Right now, we're only going to talk about molecules, where we use symbols for the elements and the number of those atoms present. So let's look at some of these examples. Uh, CO2, carbon dioxide. This tells us very specifically that this is one molecule of carbon and two oxygen atoms. Okay, And it's a discrete unit. I'm going to skip around a little bit because some of these are a little bit different. We'll go back. CH4, methane. Again, a discrete unit of a carbon covalently bound to four hydrogens and not bound to other stuff. We'll talk about these formulae and what they mean. Um, but you, you see what I'm getting at here? It's one thing. The reason that's important is those little subscripts on the bottom, when we get into balancing equations and all of that, those aren't changeable. Those tell you how many of each type of atom is in the molecule, in the molecule that's held together. And you can have more or fewer molecules, but you can't. But when you change the numbers of each in the molecule, you change the basic identity of that molecule, and that's uh, so that we'll we'll keep that in mind. There are a couple of these that are a little bit weird. Uh, SiO two is silica, which is actually not a molecule of one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. But a large solid is actually what most of the Earth is made out of. Well, most of the Earth's crust, anyway. That's what sand is. That's what uh, rocks are, primarily. Um, it's actually a big, big thing that isn't really described as a molecule. It's sort of a extended solid, if you will. Um, and all that's saying is that inside that solid, inside that rock, it's all bonded together, and there's approximately two oxygens for every silicon atom. So it's more of a ratio. Um, P205 is another example of that, about, of that, where it's a larger molecule. It actually is P4010. But um, because that's reducible, we use the smallest formula. What is that? What? What is P205? Uh, diphosphorus pentoxide is a desiccant. It's something that absorbs water very readily. In fact, like dangerously readily in many cases. It's, it's, uh, it can take water very, it can absorb water very quickly and it gets really hot and can actually um, cause fires and stuff. But it's a very strong, very strongly hygroscopic uh, material used in the lab for various things. It's also a precursor to a lot of other things. Um, you can make phosphoric acid from it. You can do some other stuff with it. So let's talk about what we mean when we draw these little things that I've been drawing. Now, in the second part of the semester, we're going to talk about how specifically to draw these and how you know what shape molecules are going to be. We're going to get into the, all that later. But now, I just want you to make sure to, that, that you know and I know and we're clear on what these things mean when we say them. Uh, when we draw a molecule like this, each line that we draw represents a covalent bond consisting of two electrons. Right? So when we draw two lines, 
like up here in carbon dioxide, that means that the carb each carb that the carbon is sharing four electrons, two in each covalent bond with each oxygen. We don't draw lines when we talk about uh, ionic bonding or metallic bonding. We only draw lines when we talk about covalent bonding. All right. Uh, what that means for you, and we'll get into ions in a little bit, but that means that even though you may have seen it before, something like NaCl should not really be drawn this way. It's really not an accurate representation of what sodium chloride is. Um, it's not a covalent structure. They're not sharing electrons. It's ionic, and we'll talk about, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, but these lines should only be used for covalent structures. And in a little while, we'll learn how you know whether something's going to be covalent or not. Other things you might see, you probably have seen, ball and stick models, space filling models. So when we talk about the molecular formula over on the left, we're talking about how many of each type of atom are in the molecule. The structural formula, formula gives us a little more information because it it tells us how things are connected with covalent bonding. The ball and stick model doesn't give us much more information except geometry, sometimes a good way to look at it. And then the space filling mo model shows the relative sizes and orientation. And th the space filling model is really difficult to deal with, you know, it's because stuff is obscured by other stuff and some you can see some atoms, you can't see other ones. But that's more of the real representation of what the molecule looks like in real life. You can approximate a molecule as a sphere with the electrons kind of at the average positions of the electrons. And you can say that they interact in roughly that way. So we use space filling models when we care about what the overall size or shape of the molecule is. Or if we're trying to see where something might fit in a particular molecule because that's a better approximation of what the reality is of the molecule. So that's covalent stuff. Any questions about those terms? Okay, stop me as usual if you if anything's unclear or you want to talk more about anything. Let's talk about ions. So we're gonna talk about ionic bonding. Can you give me can someone give me an example of an ion? Okay, just an A. Minus plus. Let's go with plus, it's a little more common. Uh, a lot more common, actually. What's another ion that you might encounter? It's like you guys have seen this before or something. Um, how about a larger ion? You know any ions that have more than one atom in them? Who knows one of those? Sulfate, sure. Do you know the formula for sulfate? SO4 minus 2 or 2 minus. I don't really care if you do the uh, minus 2 or the 2 minus. Um, convention is often that the number goes first, just for clarity's sake. If you have a bunch of these, it's, it's easy to mistake SO4 minus 2 for SO4 minus if you don't happen to see the 2 or if it's off a little bit. That's why we put the number first. Um, but it means the same thing. I don't really care. Yeah, so here are some larger ions. Uh, phosphate is another one. Uh, they can be positively charged as well. What's this one? Ammonium. Yeah. And ions come about from having an imbalance of electrons and protons. In, on the atomic scale, for, so for one atom, that's pretty straightforward. If you take a potassium atom and you lose an electron, the charge must be preserved in the overall equation, but the electron is lost. And so E minus is our shorthand generally for electrons. So if you've lost the electron, you, only have, you still have 19 protons because it's still potassium, but you only have 18 electrons, so that's an overall positive charge of 1. And now we call this a potassium ion or potassium cation. What's a, a positively charged ion called? A cation. And what's a negatively charged ion called? An anion, right. 
So let's say that chlorine gains electrons and becomes an anion. This one's going to look a little bit different because what is elemental chlorine? What's the formula for elemental chlorine? It's Cl2. And if you haven't noticed this by now, I connect my C and my L in chlorine because uh, if, you, if I haven't, then sometimes people mistake it for CI if you just go CL. I don't recommend that you do that necessarily. It's up to you because now people just think that I'm writing U. But I guess it's confusing either way. You just got to look at the context. Uh, CL2 gains electrons. It actually has to gain two electrons, one for each atom. And then we end up with two Cl minus ions. And that's a chloride. Notice that we didn't really change the name of potassium. We went from potassium to potassium ion. But we went from chlorine to chloride. And that's generally true in the elements, that forming a positive ion, forming a cation, doesn't change the name, but forming an anion will. And usually the ide is the uh, suffix that's it's used. All right, now we have to chart we have to talk a little bit about well let's see. Do we get into all that yet? No. Where these things are in the periodic table. So if you look, of course you can look up there or up there, depending on what's more convenient for you. You see sodium way over on the left, you see chlorine way over on the right. Can you make a generalization about what types of ions are more likely to form? Based on their positions in the periodic table, what would you say? Yeah, and that's generally true. Uh, negative ions tend to form on the right, um, positive ions on the left. The only real major exception there is the far right row, which is the noble gases. Those are unreactive. But if, well, relatively less reactive, let's say. If you ignore that whole column, then yeah, pretty much the negative ions are going to be on the right, positive ions are going to be on the left. When we get into electron um, counting and configurations, you'll see why that is. So let's look at ionic bonding. Note the difference in the definition. What did we say was a covalent bond? Shared electrons. And so an ionic bond is is not really even an interaction. It's not um, the sodium ion and a chloride ion don't interact in a meaningful way. They're simply held together by electrostatic forces. Electrostatic forces just meaning positive and negative charges attract each other. We know that it's true of many different types of particles. Um, so the, the ionic bonding is really just a force of attraction, and these things kind of end up close to each other, and that really changes their properties significantly. Sodium metal is a soft metallic solid, soft as in you can deform it by pushing on it, you can cut it easily with a butter knife. Um, chlorine, Cl2, that should be, not Cl, is a greenish gas. Okay? That's a Cl-Cl molecule, a molecule with a covalent bond between chlorine and chlorine. But when you make sodium chloride, the ionic solid, it's clear, it's crystalline, right? it's cubic, you can see those faces. Um, and it's a solid. It's, it's hard to melt. It's hard to certainly hard to vaporize. And so an ionic solid, also known as a salt, is a solid consisting of oppositely charged ions. Now, we use salt to talk about like table salt or sodium chloride specifically. Um, but here, we're also going to use salt as a general term to mean any ionic solid. Any solid consisting of positive and negatively charged ions, we're going to call a salt. So let's talk about some ions. What would you call these ions, by the way? First one would be? Yes. Well, what specifically is the name of Cl minus? Chloride, right? What about Br minus? Bromide. Bromide, and then sodium plus? Sodium. 
and potassium plus is still potassium, potassium ion. Right. And then there are some polyatomic ions as well. Right. You know these guys? Nitrate, sulfate, ammonium, phosphonium. Some more common than others. All right, I want to direct you to Blackboard. Let's look at the periodic table. Um, again, you've seen these sorts of things before. We've talked about these numbers a little bit. You got the atomic number, you got the mass number. I actually jumped the gun about talking about the isotopic abundance because that's in the notes later. But you know, it's just so exciting. I couldn't wait. I just had to, just had to get it out. Um, some of the elements are based on old names. Like I said, anybody know where the why tungsten is W? Where does that come from? Uh, in this case, it's actually German. Wolfram is the is the old uh, name for that element. But yeah, in many cases, it comes from the old Latin names um, and mineral names. So like, antimony is Sb, which comes from stibnium, which came from stibnite, which is an which is a mineral. Sb2s3 that was mined somewhere where that word was a name of place, uh, a name of a place, or something like that. So, in a lot of cases, these things were named before we even knew what the elements were. They were named after the rock that they came from, and so that's where some of those symbols come from. All right, let's start splitting up the periodic table. First split is going to be metals and nonmetals. Where does that split happen? Yeah, the, the black line, that kind of staircase there. So everything to the left is basically a metal. Everything to the right is basically a non-metal. Now, are those hard and fast designations? Is that something that is a natural thing? Of course not. That's something we use to understand things better. But in general, most of the stuff over on the left has these properties. They tend to be conductive. They conduct electricity. Malleable, what does malleable mean? Malleable technically means hammered into thin sheets. So you can hammer it into a sheet. Um, but yeah, in general, kind of bendable. Lustrous, what does lustrous mean? Shiny. Shiny, yep, shiny. And ductile, what is ductile? Yeah, you can, you can make it into a wire. You can pull it into a thin wire. All right, metals tend to lose electrons, so they tend to become positive. Hence that pattern we noticed earlier where the stuff on the left seems to be positive. Um, and then you've got alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, and the transition metals. So the, let's talk about those before we get into the nonmetals. Alkaline metals are the ones all the way on the left, and they form one plus ions. That's group one. Now these have been covered up with, there are two systems of, of numbering on the periodic table. There's the A's and B's, and then there's the just 1 through 18 way, OK? So they're either group 1A or group 1. Same idea. They all lose an electron. They all become 1 plus cations. All right, you can count on it. Then you've got the alkaline earth metals, the next column over. Those are going to form 2 plus ions, lose 2 electrons either group 2 or group 2A. And then you have the transition metals, which in this designation are all the Bs. And the other designation are 3 through 13, or 12, 3 through 12, yeah. Those elements have varying electron counts. They can often have many different oxidation states. So they can be plus 1 or plus 2 or plus 3 or plus 4, up to plus 6 or 7. Um, they do all kinds of different things. And their chemistry is really interesting and, and rich. But nice, even rules don't really apply to them. So we're not going, you're not going to be responsible for a lot of transition metal behavior in this class because it's so varied and it doesn't conform to rules very well. But you should know that that middle block is called the transition metals. All right, let's look over at the nonmetals then. So you got the little staircase thingy, um, things like boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. 
think about these things. Think about these elements that you've seen or that you know about, and think about how they differ from metals. And you can sort of get an idea of where that classification comes up. We talk about carbon. What does carbon look like? Black. It's black. It's brittle. Right? It crumbles easily. It, uh, what else? It's, it's a good graphite. can be a good lubricant. Right? Of course, carbon can also be diamond, which is a special form of it, but also not metallic at all. Right? You can't press a diamond into a sheet or uh, pull it into a wire. And it's shiny in a way, but it's not really lustrous uh, in the way that a metal is, that kind of metallic, shiny look. These things tend to be insulators. They don't conduct electricity. Uh, sometimes they're gases or liquids. Um, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine are all gases at room temperature. The, the noble gases are gases. Bromine is a, foam, is a, a fuming brown liquid. It's a liquid, but it gives off a brown smoke. And these guys tend to gain electrons and form covalent bonds with other nonmetals. Now, the gain electrons thing is not as hard and fast of a rule as the lose electron thing was for the metals. Um, certainly, carbon can have positive oxidation states, and, and the other elements there can as well. Even the halogens can. Um, but they tend to gain electrons in the more common structures. And I guess, hang on, let me highlight one thing. The thing that I would really highlight about the nonmetals is the covalent bonding. Um, metals can covalently bond in certain situations and in type, certain types of compounds, but not nearly as much as the nonmetals. So you'll notice that when we talk about covalently bound materials, when we talk about molecules, we're almost always looking at nonmetals. Other gases that you should know, or other, I'm sorry, not gases, other groups that you should know, the halogens, where are the halogens? Yeah, 7A or group 17 on the other designation. Fluorine, cl chlorine, bromine, and iodine are the halogens. They are anions, they gain one electron in most situations when they are an anion, but they can also be part of polyatomic ions. Why don't we generally include AT in that? What is AT, by the way? This is not one that you really need to know. But. AT is acetine, element 85. And we don't do a whole lot with acetine because it's radioactive. So it's not around very long. You, know, you can't just get a bottle of it. Uh, and it certainly doesn't behave like the other noble gases, or the other halogens. So uh, when we talk about halogens, we're usually just speaking about those four elements. And you got noble gases, unlikely to lose or gain electrons, although there are some exceptions. And pretty much every little group and subgroup and part has uh, some names. Anybody know what the nictides are? Or the nictogens? Close. That's actually the group under nitrogen, uh, are the nictogens. Uh, and then you've got the calcogenides or the calcogens for the atoms, which are the elements under oxygen. What? Uh, calcogens. It's uh, C H A L C O G A N. Those names aren't really important to know. But I don't know. Um, no, I, I would imagine. I did. I do know what calcogen comes from. I don't remember though. It comes from the minerals. Like these came from this sort of thing, and so that's where those came from. We could look it up. We do have the internets. Um, all right, periods. Because you all got this wrong on the pretest. I don't know if you did actually. I didn't really check. But periods go across. Groups go down. Which, if you think about the meanings of those words, that makes sense. A group is things that are, have, share some common property. So the elements look, going down will generally have uh, common, some common properties in terms of types of ions they like to form, types of bonds they like to form, types of structures they like to form. 
Um, periods is think about think of a period of a wave. Right? It's like one cycle. So you go across, you got one cycle, and then you're back to where you started from. You go across, you have a cycle, you go back to where you started from. So um, second period would be lithium, beryllium, boron, and so on, right? All right, so let's think about what that means then when we encounter new things. When you encounter new elements, look for where it is and think about what you know around it. So let's say you know that oxygen forms, readily forms two minus ions. It would be reasonable to expect that sulfur and selenium and tellurium also readily form two minus ions. And in fact, you'd be right, they do. Um, other things. Let's say you know that carbon commonly forms four bonds, which is true. Maybe you don't know that. That's fine, but it's true. Uh, you might also expect silicon and germanium to form four bonds. Also true. Also true. Okay. Um, yeah. The only place where that's a little bit suspect it becomes in the transition metals, where everything kind of gets all screwy and things have different properties for various reasons. So in the third period, let's list them out just for fun. You got sodium, and let's make sure we know these were these uh, names: sodium, magnesium, aluminum. Then what? Silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Okay, make sure you know those names. The only names I would say you don't need to know are anything radioactive. Anything with the little parentheses in the bottom. If it has the parentheses, it means that it doesn't really stick around for long enough for us to use it for a whole lot, um, with the exception of some of the very early ones in the 90s, like neptunium plutonium. For the purposes of this class, you also don't need to know the lanthanides, which are the top row that's separate, so element 58 through 71. We're not going to run into that a whole lot. Um, does everybody know how that works, by the way? Have you seen those? Where you see that little star in element 57, lanthanum, that means that before you go to the next one, you actually go down and have all those. So the true layout of the periodic table should have those two, should have, like, you part that whole periodic table this way, and you stick those two rows in there. That would be really inefficient for design purposes. So we just collapse it together and put those two below. All right, but that's actually where they should be. You, you should split that whole table across and put those two rows in between. When we talk about electron counts and, and orbitals, you'll see why that is. Does anybody know offhand? Yes? yes? What are you going to tell us? OK. <laughs> All right, let's start talking a little bit about naming, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a little break, and we'll come back. So this is actually a great day for those of you who haven't liked the math so far, but don't worry, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to it. It's not going away forever. Um, all right, naming compounds. Naming compounds is always mm -hmm. troublesome because there are many different kinds and there are many different ways to name things. And over the years, people have tried to standardize this to make it makes sense to make it easier to follow the rules. Um, and they've done a pretty good job of that. So we're going to deal mostly with these systematic names. How do you name something using a rule that always applies? Um, that said, very common things are often referred to by their common names. And those names just won't go away. So things like saltpeter, Epsom salts, laughing gas, grain alcohol, wood alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, um, what are some other good common names? Uh, ethylene glycol. Um, you know, there's lots. Just things that are common that we use all the time and that it would be awkward to name by their official systematic names. So that makes your job a little bit tougher because you might encounter these things. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? That's just how it goes. In any case that I can think of, um, 
on an exam or a quiz type situation, we'd be looking just for the systematic names, not the common names. All right, we're going to break this up into a few different types. We're going to talk about how to name each type and, and what makes something fit into a certain type. So first, we're going to start with the easiest, the binary compounds. How many elements are in a binary compound? Two, right. Two elements. Okay. You got a positive ion, which is the cation, which is always written first. And then a negative ion, the anion, is always written second. So some of these we've seen today, things like sodium chloride. Um, here's another one we haven't seen, potassium sulfide. Calcium oxide, aluminum oxide. All these compounds have only two elements. And you've pro you may have picked up how to name them by the things that I just said in writing these down. They're, sim they're, the, they're the simplest to name, for sure. You name the, the cation first, and then you name the anion. All right? The monoatomic, or one atom cation, takes the name from the name of the element. Notice calcium oxide. That's a calcium ion, but I didn't change the name. It's still calcium. So, for example, what do we call sodium in these types of compounds? Sodium. sodium. No. No. The quantity of these in this type of compound doesn't matter. Why does that not matter? Because we know, or we can figure out the quantity by the charge, and we know the charge on these atoms, or vice versa. The anion is you take the element name, you cut the end off, and you put ide. So nitrogen 3 minus would be nitride. All right, so here's the nice little graphic from your book that talks about it. Yeah, your name of the cation, your name of the anion. So, CaO, which I just did, but you can do it again. What is it? Calcium oxide. Calcium oxide, good. What about SRF2? SRF2. Strontium fluoride, right. Strontium fluoride. Should I write that out? And what about K2SE? Potassium selenide. Do a couple more. How about TiO2? Titanium oxide. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, the, in commonly, it's also referred to as titanium dioxide, but in this particular type, that's not necessary. We'll, actually, we'll talk about why that's sometimes necessary in that one. Um, how about trying to get find a good one? RB3P. Let's put this on here. I'm not. I don't think this actually exists, but <laughs> rubidium phosphide. Right, rubidium phosphide. So you get the the idea of how these things are named. All right. So let's go to type two. Type 2 ions are the titanium that I just talked about, so I jumped ahead a little bit. In type 2 binary ionic compounds, we deal with cations that might have more than one type of charge. We talked about how all the ones on the left are plus 1, all the ones second from the left are plus 2, but all the ones in the middle can have all kinds of different charges. So we need a way to specify that. Let's look at iron, for instance. 
Iron can commonly be either 2 plus or 3 plus state. So either it's missing 2 electrons or it's missing 3 electrons. So we need to denote that. Using the previous way of naming, these would both be called iron chloride, right? But those are different compounds, so we need to be able to distinguish that. There are, there's an old way and there's a new way to do that. Uh, unfortunately, you should know both of them. The new way, the more systematic way, is what's given here in the diagram. It's the name of the cation, the charge of the cation in Roman numerals and parentheses, and then the anion. So in the new way, this one is iron 2 chloride. And this one is iron 3 chloride. But the old way didn't really go away because I guess people don't like calling it iron 2 or iron 3. So the old way is to end the higher charge in ick and the lower charge in us. So Fe3 plus or iron 3 plus is called a ferric ion, and iron 2 plus is called a ferrous ion. And that means FeCl3 would be called what? Yeah, ferric chloride. And then FeCl2 would be ferrous chloride. So let's try these in both ways. So first, the newer, easier way, CuCl versus CuCl2. So if we're using the Roman numerals, what's CuCl? Copper 1 chloride, right? What? It is necessary, because if you don't put put the number, you don't know which, right? Either of these could be copper chloride. So you need the number to tell you if it's copper one or copper two. So that one's copper one chloride. This one is copper two chloride. And what about the other way to name it? Yeah, it's cuprous chloride and cupric chloride. So the reason that this is annoying is that not only do you have to know that us and ick thing, but you have to know what that name is that was used with the us and the ick. Um, and there's no, real good, there's no real systematic way to do that. You saw that with iron, it used the old name ferrous and ferric. With cuprous, uh, with copper, you again use the old names of cuprous and cupric. But with mercury, even though it's HG, you still use that mercury word. So this one is mercurous chloride and this one is mercuric chloride or mercury 1 chloride or mercury 2 chloride and then remember that Roman numeral method is only used when there is more than one ionic compound that can form between the two elements. So in those sodiums, magnesiums, potassiums, rubidiums, those kinds of things, we don't use that system because there's only one possible ion. It's only in the transition metals where there's difference that we use that. Yeah? Is there any way that it's going to be more than Yes. Yes, some of the other transition metals have many more possible oxidation states. In those cases, you can't use uh, this other nomenclature. So you only use the numbers in those cases.
And that's also why the Roman numeral method is a better method overall, because it works in all the cases. All right, a couple exceptions, of course. There's always exceptions. Silver, it only really forms a 1 plus charge. So we don't really use the, no, the uh, Roman numeral notation for silver. We just say silver chloride or whatever, silver nitrate. Zinc only forms 2 plus cations, so same deal. We don't specify the Roman numerals in zinc. So how do you figure this out if you don't know these, if you don't know the charge? Here's the key to that. It's normally easier to evaluate the charge on the ion, or on the anion, than on the cation for these types of compounds. Let's go back and look at some of the examples we've seen. Okay. We know that chlorine, when it's an anion, is always minus 1. Since the overall compound has to be neutral, then we can figure out if that copper on the right is copper 2 or copper 1. Same thing with the iron that we looked at up here with the mercury. Okay, that was all chloride. But generally, that's the case. So you can figure out, so you get the charge on the anion because you know it, and then you figure out the charge on the cation and you know which one to put. Um, the rules about whether it's whether you use the parentheses or not is just that you have to know that the ones over on the left, those two rows, are plus two and that's it. Uh, then you've got co uh, zinc and silver as exceptions and everything else in the transition metals you should use the numbers for. All right, and then our final category, well, okay, our final part of this category, we still have a couple other categories, are the polyatomic ions. The, and these are the ones I mentioned before on that list. These are the tough ones for most people until you get a sense of what these things are called. They're tough because there is no nice way to figure them out. You simply have to know what they are. Uh, so what's this first one? Ammonium hydroxide, good. What's the next one then? Ammonium chloride. How about this one? Calcium carbonate. Next one, ammonium nitrate. So you got these. And potassium nitrate. And last one. Now, yes, you have to memorize all those, but there's one trick that can help you, and that's the oxyanions, anions that contain oxygen. You can figure out what anion that's going to be based on the number of oxygen atoms present. So you only have to really memorize the extreme or one of them, and you can figure out all the other ones. Example, for the chlorines, you've got per chlorate, which means more than chlorate, ClO4 minus, that has the most oxygen. Then you've got chlorate, one fewer oxygen. Then you've got chlorite, and ite always has less than eight, than the eight, not eight the number, but yeah. And then hypochlorite means less than that, and it's going to have the smallest number of oxygen. All those atoms have the same charge, 
So if you know one of them, you can figure out the other ones because that naming system always works. So you've got sulfate and sulfite. You've got nitrate and nitrite. Um, you've got bromate and, and perbromate and hypobromate. Uh, you've got, uh, yeah, any of these. Periodate, iodate, any of these oxyanions, which if you go back to that handout, is actually a good chunk of the bottom of the list. You can figure a lot of those out simply by knowing this pattern of prefixes and suffixes. So that brings your work down a little bit there. So let's try some of those. What's this one going to be? Careful. Yeah. This one is sodium sulfite. Remember? Up here, sulfate had four oxygens, so sulfite has three oxygens. one? Sodium bicarbonate, right. HCO3 is bicarbonate. So then what would this be? Hmm, wait, sorry, not that one. Potassium bisulfate. Okay, another little rule. Okay, that's a good stopping place. So let's take uh, 15 minutes and come back and we'll continue naming and then we'll go talk about moles.